ready to go? I am. All right, here we go. So five, four, three, two, and one. All right, guys, welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. Today, I am very excited to have as my guest, Alisa Zapersky. Alisa, welcome. Thank you. Happy to be here. All right. So Alisa is a storyteller, writer, facilitator, and childhood sexual abuse survivor. Her work focuses on offering emotional support to other young survivors healing from sexual trauma. She's a, a Moth Story Slam competition champ. She's been in publications such as Allure, Teen Vogue, Bust, Time, The Guardian, uh, and Voices for Change. She's also been on Voices for Change 2.0 podcast. Uh, while based in Washington, D.C., she travels around the country giving talks and facilitating workshops to support other young survivors in their communities. Awesome. All right. So before we get started here, so you're in D.C. now. Where are you from originally? From the D.C. suburbs. So cool. um, so this is home. Okay. All right. So, well, let's dive in here. First of all, we're talking during this whole crazy COVID time. How are you... Uh, period. How are you doing? How are you handling it? I am doing well. I live with my husband and my dog um, in a beautiful apartment in DC. And I have a lot of privilege um, and I'm able to be home and work from home. My husband's able to be home and work from home. So um, we're very privileged, very lucky right now. Um, and we're doing okay. Good, good, good. All right. It's good to have, I, I might say also, it's good to have an excuse to, you know, shower and wash my hair. So I appreciate that. <laughs> you providing that today. Nice. You're welcome. Keeping it clean here. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, let me turn this light on here. So what, all right, so let's dive in here. What, how did you get to this point? I'm fascinated by it. I was reading your bio and like, and I was thinking to myself, I, I just really enjoy talking to people like you who are, are, how do you turn what you've gone through into what you're doing now? Anyway, that, that's what I was thinking. But anyway, yeah. tell us your story. So, um, so I'm 32 years old and live here in Washington, D.C., and, um, and I'm a childhood sexual abuse survivor. I was harmed by a parent, and like so many other CSA survivors, I really didn't experience my trauma um, until I was in my 20s, like really process it um, in a in a way that I could sort of cognitively understand, and I was 20 years old, and um, a parent, not the one who harmed me, um, died. And the grief of that loss uh, was the first time I was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, the trauma of that loss triggered the trauma of my childhood. And it was really in my 20s that I was first coming to understand that, um, that I had been sexually abused because my memories didn't look like what I thought they would look like. It wasn't a narrative memory with a clear beginning, middle, and end. Um, I was really processing non-narrative or body or somatic memories of what I had been through and, um, and was really processing, processing that in a non-linear way throughout my 20s. And it was really when I was 27 and I was experiencing um, harassment at the job I was at where all of these things just sort of crescendoed together. And I realized I, I just needed to sort of burn it all down to build it back up. And I decided that I, what would be most healing for me is to just be as honest and clear about what I'd been through and what I had endured. And I think I was just really tired of feeling alone and feeling the stigma of what I thought it meant to be in my 20s and to have been sexually abused by a parent. Um, and I just was tired of feeling alone and just had this hunch, like maybe there are other people out there that are grappling with the same questions that I am that feel so isolated. And what would happen if I just sort of put it out there? Mm -hmm. So you said you, things started happening for you when you were 20. Does that mean that prior to that, you weren't aware of it? Yeah. Prior okay. to that, I wasn't aware of it. I always had a really, you know, um, difficult relationship with my father who harmed me and, um, he wasn't in the house. It was somebody, you know, it was 
I was with him on the weekends and I um, went through periods of time, you know, where I was sort of fighting back and resisting in my own ways. But uh, I don't really, you know, the number of memories I have from age two to probably 13, I can count on my, on my fingers. You know, I don't mm. remember much of those years. And, um, and it's all sort of a, a blur to me. And I remember never feeling safe in my body. And mm. I remember feeling afraid and feeling deeply, deeply guilty. Like, um, yeah, like I was responsible for this person and their happiness and that it was my job to sacrifice myself for that. Yeah. Now, can I, I mean, obviously we're talking about delicate issues here. Yeah, and yeah. You're not required. I just want to put this out there yeah. to talk about anything you don't want to talk about. So I just want yeah. to set that up. At the same time, mm -hmm. um, let me know if I can ask certain questions or not. Totally. But, so was was this over did this abuse happen over the period of, of years or was this one uh, you know i i single? don't know okay. i don't know and you know i um jennifer freyd who's an incredible psychologist and leader out of the university of oregon and stanford university is the founder of the institute for um center for institutional courage who's written about betrayal tar trauma and um and Darvo, who wrote Betrayal Trauma, talks about, I mean, in, her, in her study, she found that there was a correlation between the level of betrayal that um, a child was experiencing in their, in their sexual abuse um, and how little they remembered of what had happened. So uh, for as, as intense of the, as the betrayal was, meaning like it was a parent or somebody that you relied on in, in the most fundamental and significant way, that um, it correlated with how much the, the child then adult remembered of what had happened. Mm -hmm. And that is really aligned with my experience and the experience of so many people I hear from. You know, I have been writing and speaking for four years now. And three years ago, it was March of 2017, I wrote this article called What It's Like to Remember What You Can't Remember. And it felt to me like I was writing this confession. Like, I just have to tell you all, you've been following me. We've been talking about all this stuff. And like, sometimes I feel like a fraud because I don't have a clear memory of what happened. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you from this year to this year, not year. And I know survivors who are harmed by a parent too, who can, you know, and I felt like I just have to be honest with you all that this is, you know, these are my body memories and this is my struggle to accept that. Mm -hmm. And to this day, it remains the single most popular uh, thing I've ever written, I would say 90% of my traffic to my website is people Googling cannot remember what happened to me or can I heal if I can't remember. And, you know, right now in particular is such a triggering time for people. My website traffic is as high as it was when in the weeks after the Harvey Weinstein story broke um, mm -hmm. on healinghonestly.com. And it's, and I'm hearing from survivors every day in my inbox who are um, being triggered during this time right now by non-narrative memories that they're experiencing a lot of them clearly for the first time mm -hmm. so it's interesting that this this part of my story that i felt like was this deep confession ended up being actually what hundreds of thousands of people really needed to hear and feel most connected to so you, uh, and I want to have that uh, article linked up. Obviously, we'll have your website linked up at the show sure. page, but that article too. So you got to a point, talk, mm -hmm. to, talk to us about the point where you were like, okay, something mm -hmm. happened. I need to get help. What did that look like? And what kind of help did you seek out? So I started in therapy when I was 20 years old when um, – when one of my parents was dying and I went to therapy to help get support um, to be able to be present for the end of, of their life because I wanted to be there and I didn't and I didn't know how and that 
sort of grew into uh, therapeutic support to deal with my childhood sexual abuse. I saw that therapist in the two months as when my parents was dying. And then when I was diagnosed with PTSD and, and really developing trauma from that experience, I stayed with that therapist. Um, and I have been really incredibly blessed. And unfortunately in this country, it is a privilege to be able to have access to a therapist and to have access to a therapist who is the right therapist for you. Um, but I had the privilege of, um, now I'm on my third therapist who is a woman of a certain age for whom therapy was a second career, um, who had like a lot of lived experience and decided to go into therapy. And, um, and so have been practicing uh, predominantly CBT, um, cognitive behavioral therapy for 12 years. Um, but when I was a child, I also saw a child therapist. Um, I think I was around 11, 12 years old. I was in fifth grade. I know that. So whatever age you are, when you have kids, when's fifth grade, you know, whatever. Uh, 11. Yeah. Okay, cool. So I was close. So 11. Um, and that was an incredibly, um, unlike the therapist I saw as an adult, that was an incredibly traumatic and harmful experience for me. Um, and I remember very clearly telling the child psychologist that um, I didn't want anything to, you know, my father to be hurt. I didn't want him to experience mm -hmm. any harm. I just wished he wasn't alive anymore so that I could be alive. Mm. And, you know, looking back, it's a, it's a pretty elegant solution for an 11 year old who's going through what they're going through. And her response to me was focus on something he's good at. Well, tell me something he's good at. I said, well, he's good at cooking. And she said, focus on that. And that was, you know, her sort of sending me out her door. And, mm -hmm. you know, I look back and I think that, you know, in, in preparation of talking with you today, I was really reflecting on the powerful roles that therapists um, and counselors can play in our healing journeys. And that was a really formative experience for me. And I think kept me silent for many, many years. Mm -hmm. So you go through, you, you start seeing this therapist. How do things unfold such that you're like, all right, I need to start mm. getting out there, sharing what's going on with me? Yeah, I think for me, um, I was really struggling um, being a young person, working. I was working in the nonprofit, in a nonprofit organization, a women's rights organization run by a male CEO who was harassing me. Um, it wasn't sexual harassment. He um, said that I wasn't smiling enough at work and that if I didn't disclose what was going on in my personal life, he'd take it as a sign that um, I wasn't serious about my job and demote me. And um, my job was to travel around internationally with him. That was my job. And um, I was going through my trauma and really struggling to manage the trauma I was experiencing in my personal life um, and the triggers I was experiencing in my personal life and how work was sort of replicating that. And I think that that is what's true for so many survivors. It's not just about the trauma that we experience and survive and learn to heal from. It's that, that we also experience these second forms of trauma through our lives, whether it's through institutions that are harming us or other people in positions of power who are abusing that power that then trigger our experiences all over again. And I really was going through that. And I just thought, I, you know, I had all this, I had so much financial privilege that I could walk away from that job, which is not true for most people. And I just thought I, I, I needed to change something that surely there were other people in their twenties who wanted to honor what they had been through and what they had survived and accept and talk about the fact that it was impacting every aspect of their lives, but also talk about what does it mean to be a young person dating and trying to have sex as a survivor? And what does it mean to try to hold down a job when bosses can be really awful and also abusive? And how do you deal with that? And, you know, I wanted to create a space where everything could just be complicated and alive, that two truths could be it had to be true at the same time, which was trauma impact every aspect of my life. And also I was capable and worthy of a full and vibrant life and like how to hold that together at once. 
Um, and that's what really got me to share my story, wanted, made me want to share my story and put mm -hmm. myself out there and find other people. And the wildest part was that when I, you know, I think about this four years ago, I, I thought, you know, I was the only one. And it, it's not just overwhelming to hear from people across the world who tell you, I feel the same way you do. But to find out that I had been surrounded by childhood sexual abuse survivors my entire life and had no idea. And hearing from people who were very close to me and had no idea that we actually had this shared lived experience. Mm. That's very powerful. I mean, you, you speak with a lot of uh, power and authority and Thank you. kind of groundedness. Was that always the case? Uh, I think I was always a very opinionated, um, outspoken person. Um, it, it was framed for me for a long time in my life as a weakness, that um, my inability to hold my tongue or put on a smile when I didn't feel like smiling, you know, this, that I, that what you see is what you get. You know, I used to be told I wear my heart on my sleeve or I'm too sensitive. Um, and I think I internalized that for many years and I thought I was too big and my emotions were too big and my needs were too big and that I needed to make myself smaller to fit in. And I think that's true for so many survivors, um, especially for those of us that, you know, our trauma was a part of our childhood and, and how mm -hmm. we grew up, which is that we learn how to turn off parts of ourselves and how to silence really integral parts of ourselves and our personalities to be able to be smaller, to not, you know, I think in our minds, to not create more problems, um, to keep the peace, to protect our families, um, over protecting ourselves. And so I think that those instincts are always there, but part of being public about my story was giving myself permission Mm -hmm. to be that, as, take up as much space as I wanted to take up, to let my emotions be as big as they are, to celebrate my sensitivity as a gift and not a curse. Um, mm. that it what, are, what are some of the challenges that come with kind of stepping out? What, mm. what are, yeah. are there, I, I, I mean, I would imagine that there might be yeah. some fears or insecurities or totally. what? I mean, I will say anything you think, you know, for anybody considering it, anything you think that's going to come up is going to come up. Like you get, your instincts are right. Um, so I, I'm really glad that you asked this question because I work a lot with college students um, and supporting survivors on campus. And something I heard so much this year across campuses is, you know, an unintended consequence of um, this sort of iteration of Toronto Burke's Me Too movement, um, which is not at all, I think, what the leaders intended is that um, a lot of survivors feel a lot of pressure to be public and to put their mm. names out there. Like, you know, um, when we exalt public survivors, myself included, um, by calling us courageous or heroic, um, it can have the unintended consequence of telling a survivor for whom that's not what's in their best interest for themselves, that somehow they're less courageous or they're less heroic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I want to be really clear, like when I came forward and I put my name out there, my full name, for me, that made me feel safer. And for other people, that exact same decision might, mm -hmm. maybe they've lived the exact same thing as me. And what's safer for them is not that. It made me, you know, for me, it was aligned with my safety and my needs and my healing. And that's just right. so individual to each person. And so anybody who's listening, who's feeling like this pressure, I just want to just want to tell you, just being a survivor and existing in the world takes tremendous courage. And that's like the end. That's period. Full that's stop. a really good point. And I, I think it's also useful for the therapists out there, too, who could, you know, I think one could very easily assume uh, if you're working with someone that, you know, there's a lot of courage in, in sharing one story, but you're right that each person has their own journey. And I think you're also, you also hit it right on the head too, just living after having gone through. I can't imagine going through something like that. How do you, how does one, well, let's, I mean, what I'm talking to you, how do you deal with that as a parent? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I, and I, you know, I, I think that there are, there are really incredible people. A friend of mine, Ignacio Rivera, they're the founder of the HEAL Project. Um, they're a childhood sexual abuse survivor who was also harmed by a family member. And they have this incredible, incredible, incredible YouTube 
series with their daughter called Pure Love Talks. And it's a talk show between Ignacio and their daughter, who's, who's grown, whose daughter and their daughter now has a baby. So it's actually multi-generational. And they really talk about that. They talk about how difficult it is to parent as a survivor um, and how parenting can be so triggering and can bring up so much trauma and fear for their child, um, and especially as their child becomes the age that they may have experienced that harm. And so, you know, I myself am not a parent and don't have that experience, but um, Ignacio is an incredible leader that I look to and I know is in the future as I hope to become a parent that, that they are like an invaluable resource because I know how, how triggering that can be for parents. Mm -hmm. You know, I, my mother, and I have been through a really um, long and important journey together and she has become my greatest champion. And I, I say this both because I think it deserves an extraordinary amount of credit. Um, it's not easy to watch your child put themselves out there. It's not easy to watch your child talk about their sex life publicly and all of that, you know, um, as well. And I think that you know, there's so much, it, there's so much silencing that happens by so many people when it comes to um, harm that happens within the family. And I really credit her, but I also am, I want to say like, it was a really long journey for us to get there. And I, I think it's important to say that because um, for lots of people, they're, they're deep in that struggle with their parents too. Um, but I think it's really, it's really difficult for parents um to support their child and to also acknowledge the limitations of their capacity to have protected their child from that harm mm. let me just remind everyone that i'm speaking with uh lisa zapersky and her website is healing so all right you've been doing this doing this i want to talk more about yeah. what this is you've been doing this what for this four four years so mm -hmm. what do you what's your goal what are you doing mm -hmm. So for me, really what it is, it's about offering survivor to survivor emotional support. Uh, for me, I, as, as life gets more complicated um, and as my work grows, I always go back to, um, I just don't ever want anybody to feel as alone as I used to feel. And that really is just like what drives me forward in my work. Um, it's always coming back to that sort of central tenant. And so I write on my website, healinghonestly.com, and I write um, blogs. I interview other survivors. I write a lot about my own lived experiences um, in a way that is infused with a bunch of humor, I'll say too, which, you know, for me, uh, feels organic and really important um, because healing is feeling hilarious uh but no i think it's important <laughs> that you know i'm a jew we we find humor in our suffering it's how we endure um and it's actually a really part, part of my resiliency um but uh so i have the website um and i write for other publications such as uh, allure i just published or just published a piece of mine in allure where i interviewed three really incredible child sex abuse survivor leaders on the work that they're doing um but in addition to all of that, I also do a lot of public speaking and facilitation. And so um, I go around to college campuses giving talks about um, being a young person healing from sexual trauma. Um, also talking about childhood sexual abuse because on college campus we focus a lot on um, the harm that's happening on campus. But mm -hmm. actually so many people are showing up to campus um, with harm that they've already experienced and like me are in their 20s and first dealing with their trauma. College is a really normal time to be processing childhood sexual abuse for the first time. Um, and I also lead workshops um, such as a healing and writing workshop and so writing for um, sexual trauma survivors to support um, themselves in their healing. So lots of fun different parts of it but again all of it is just to again come back to like never wanting anybody to feel as alone as I felt and also not wanting anybody to feel as silenced by the stigma of CSA as I felt for so long. Wow. I, I, I mean, I just admire what you're doing um, and, and just think it's an invaluable resource. Again, you have like this amazing energy about you and I don't mean this frantic energy, but a, a, a vibe about you. Um, 
Alisa, when you're working with these uh, individuals, these, these, what, young kids, whatever, what do you, is there, is, are there themes that come up when people are talking to you? And if so, what, what are they? Definitely. Um, definitely a lot of themes. So as we talked about earlier, this theme, so I, I would say 90% of what um, my conversations with other survivors, the emails I receive, um, a lot of which start with like, I've never told anybody this, not even my therapist, but have to do with people feeling invalidated in their own survivorship like 90% of it. Um, then the rest is, I would say, like a lot about like sex and dating and like how to, you know, just like being fully alive and also dealing with this. Um, but I would say 90% of it is feeling invalidated in our own survivorship. And it's what I focus a lot of my writing on. So whether it's we feel invalidated in our survivorship because we don't have clear memories of what happened to us, or we feel invalidated in our survivorship because um, all the other people in our lives are denying what happened. So we're questioning our own realities. Um, there are a lot of different ways and it's sort of about living in a larger culture full of, you know, rape culture where survivors are receiving messages implicitly and explicitly all the time that there's some real survivor out there, but for X, Y, and Z reason, you're not it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and so a lot of my work is just centered on debunking that myth that there's some some real survivor out there that you're not for whatever reason mm. um yeah okay yeah helpful and as we kind of wind down here you know a lot of therapists of all kinds listen to this what do they need to hear about this I think what therapists really need to hear um, and what I hear again from so many people who are in therapy and afraid to talk to their therapists about this is that a lot of people are dis are attempting or, or, or trying to disclose um, in ways that might not be recognizable to a therapist. Um, for myself, I was in therapy for a year before I told my therapist that I was having nightmares of my abuser sexually harming me. Because I thought I was telling my therapist that I was like perverted. Um, and so, you know, my therapist was great and she knew that that was something really important. Um, but I think that, you know, survivors talking about feeling unsafe in their bodies or having panic attacks, thinking about being near someone or they're having visions of something. I think it's really, you know, sur CSA survivors I don't really know any that are like come out to their therapist. Like I know this thing happened to me. They're going to, I would say most of the time approach it very cautiously with, you know, some sort of body memory that they're experiencing that they are. And they're afraid that it means that there's something wrong with them. Not that something wrong happened to them. And so that's just something that I would encourage any therapist to be mindful of. Um, and just to remember also that remembering is not essential to healing, which I, you know, you've talked so much about your show on your show, which I'm so grateful for and highlighted so many leaders in this movement about that. Um, but that, you know, harping on remembering it's, it's not just not helpful. It can actually sometimes be harmful. And lastly, that, you know, I think that there's a really important role to play for therapists and for out survivors. A lot of therapists come to this work, and you've talked to so many of them about, they come to this work because they have lived experiences that inform that, and that's wonderful. But I know that a lot of people in those positions are restricted on what they can say. And so I think there is a really beautiful partnership between folks like myself who can be so open about their own personal experiences, as well as therapists who offer that professional guidance um, to work in tandem. And it always really heartens me to hear therapists use my site as a resource for that reason. Because I can say things that might not be appropriate for them to say, you know? Right. Right. Um, so that partnership is really special. Wow. Well, there's obviously uh, a lot to talk about. I mean, I'd love to have you back again. I'd love to be back. And we can talk more. There's so many different avenues to go down. Uh, Alisa, what's the best way for people to get in contact with you? Definitely through my website, healinghonestly.com. Okay. And um, in terms of any go to book recommendations, what would yeah. you say? Whether, you know, CSA related or not. Totally. Um, definitely recommend Aisha Shahida Simmons. She is an extraordinary leader in this movement. Can She's you a spell that? Oh, sure. <laughs> oh, I have to write it down to make sure I spell it right. Aisha. Um, A 
A I S H A. I'm sorry, A I S H A H. Shahida S H A D I. Oh my God, I'm, I'm now I'm like. Well, email, you can email it to me. Yeah. S H A D I A Simmons, S I M M O N S. Sorry. The book is called Love with Accountability, and she's a okay. childhood sexual abuse survivor. Her, It's an anthology of all people from the Black diaspora writing about. Um, CSA interventions that don't involve the criminal justice system. Look, it's been awesome having you on here. Um, I just really appreciate people like you who are getting the word out. I mean, this is what this is about. This is what this is why I started this podcast to help get the word out and um, just like that there are people like you like you doing it. Thank you, thank you, and thank you for all your hard work. Your uh, your work means a great deal to me. I appreciate it. Take care. Bye.